Snow has begun falling again. It generally comes for a few months out of the year. Though this year and the year past, it's fallen more sporadically, fickle in its temperament. Snow can signify a lot of things. The comforting consistency of seasons, the dread of isolating oneself from the harsher elements. Memories sweet and bittersweet. More than anything, snow reminds me of white nights. No, no, not that White Nights. I'm talking about the 1957 film, Le Notti Bianche. Sorry, I don't speak Italian. It's White Nights in Italian. Like many influential works, Le Notti Bianche explores universal aspects of the human condition, namely social isolation, unrequited love, and the escapist allure of dreams as it encroaches upon reality. This should be no surprise for those familiar with the author of the film's source material, Fyodor Dostoevsky. From Notes from the Underground to the Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky has been considered a pioneering existentialist in literature exploring the inner lives of various social strata of late 19th century Russia. This ability of understanding and sheer empathy is evident in the much earlier work, the 1848 short White Nights. The story follows a young man recounting an experience he had in St. Petersburg where he met a forlorn girl waiting to reunite with her lover. Over the following four nights, the two connect on an intrinsic level to the point where, believing the lover will never return, the girl, Nastenka, believes their relationship could instead prosper into something romantic. Shortly after, her lover appears and Nastenka and him leave the man. In an afterward, the man recounts how he received a letter from Nastenka inviting him to their wedding. The man cries, but refuses to make this a pitiable chapter in his life, culminating in the story's final line, My God, a whole moment of bliss. Isn't that enough for an entire lifetime? For appearing so early in his writing career, White Knights is profound for its commentary on the interiority of man, with much to teach us about the pitfalls of dreaming, but also the power of retrospection, and making something beautiful out of seeming tragedy. 1957 saw the first adaptation of the story in film form with Lucino Visconti's Le Notti Bianche, notable for transferring the setting from 1840 St. Petersburg to a then contemporary mock-up of Livorno, Italy, and featuring theatrical flourishes distinguishing themselves from Visconti's earlier neorealist features. Despite some changes from the source material, the way in which it's adapted retains most of the universal themes of Dostoevsky's original work and flourishes in this transitionary period in Visconti's filmography. Let's jump right in. If you want to skip the summary portion of this video, I elect you to follow this time code. The film opens much like Rocco e suoi fratelli with a bus ride, with our protagonist Mario departing with his work's supervisor and his family. They talk and make plans, but Mario bids goodnight and wanders down the streets of Livorno. Businesses are closed, and though he's eager to strike a conversation or make someone's acquaintance, he's utterly alone in throngs of people. The only companion he comes across is a dog, the only creature who can't refuse his company. Funny story, when I was in Conca de Marini, I had this exact interaction where I walked by a stranger's open door at night and we'd exchange bonaceras. The mood is more like a noir, as Nino Rota's booming brass almost seems to indicate danger. He looks up to people's windows, hoping to see some sort of human interaction, only for them to be shut to him. Perhaps like his counterpart in Dostoevsky's novel, he feels as if people are purposefully abandoning him, even though they're likely just departing for bed. Also, there's this part where the dog very clearly just pisses on the side of a building, and I just, and I just imagine the Chinichita set dressers were just like, Ma che caso, how are we gonna explain this, you know? Anyway, Mario comes across a particular canal bridge where he spies a fair-haired woman, Natalia, crying. He's curious and scolds some bikers who harass her, eventually asking if he can join her on her walk home. Perhaps from finding someone in a vulnerable state, he confides in her that she's the first person he's opened up to here. È la prima volta da quando mi hanno trasferito qui che sto un po' con qualcuno e mi ha fatto piacere. 
ma con loro sono sempre stato zitto. Poi una volta rimasto solo mi è venuta a me la voglia di parlare, di stare in compagnia con qualcuno. Finally warmed up to him a bit, she agrees to meet him again tomorrow at 10 at the same spot. However, after seeing he's left, she heads out to the same spot at the bridge to wait. The following morning, Mario is woken and harangued by his shrewd landlady, later pleading with her to get his clothes ironed. It's a nice slice of life and comedic moment that she harasses him for his laziness, yet he wants to look nice to see Natalia later. Later that night, Mario awaits Natalia at a bar, where he's eyed by a comely prostitute, but he ignores her. Spotting Natalia through the window, he goes to meet her, but she runs, ending up in a chicken coop. Upset about the lengths she went to avoid him, he leaves, but she follows. One aspect of Natalia's character in this version is in her contradictions. She runs, then chases, push and pull. Here it's because she didn't want him to think that she was that type of girl who makes dates with strangers. Still sore from the interaction, he acquiesces in talking to her nonetheless. She actually initiates, saying they should get to know each other, and asks him about himself. Funnily, he gets out a sentence or two before she divulges about her own family. Her father and mother ran off, and to keep her from doing the same, her nearly blind grandmother would keep Natalia pinned to her skirt with a safety pin. But finally, she reveals she's waiting for someone, and tells the story of the fateful day the lodger came. The scene transition here is quite brilliant, going from Natalia beginning to tell the story in this bombed out area, to her in the past in the room with her grandmother. She's so taken with the lodger, and how can you not, is Jean Marais, that she sneaks into his room and goes through his things. The lodger stumbles across her and lends her several of his books to read, remarking that it's a shame she doesn't go out more. Maria Schell plays this interaction brilliantly. She's so smitten, she doesn't say a single word to him the entire time, just staring at him with infatuation, or looking away in bashfulness. The lodger takes Natalia, her grandmother, and their friend to see the Barber of Seville, where the two adequately fall in love. But the next day, the lodger terminates his lease. Natalia faints and he informs her he has to go away for a year and can't tell her why, but that he loves her and when his year is up, he'll return and they'll marry. Mario is stupefied by the story, dismissing it as a fairy tale, though when she tells him he's in town, he suggests contacting him. Though hesitant to appear too forward, she agrees and helps Mario write the letter to send to him. Before leaving, she warns Mario not to fall in love with her. The prostitute from before appears. Mario lights her cigarette and tears up the letter. The following morning, Mario wakes sneezing in Italian. The late nights out in the cold are starting to get to him, and he begins to vacillate between feeling remorse or having Natalia all to himself. Out on the town, Mario is still lonely in crowds of people, but he's starting to see some joy in it, even acting a little flirtatious at one point. He sees Natalia and tries to run. Now Natalia is the pursuer and he the evader. He initially tries to leave for a made-up appointment, then wants Natalia to come with him out on the town. Essentially, he wants to tell her he loves her and to forget her suitor, but she's still optimistic about his return. They head to a club where she says she loves him almost as much as her lover. He tries talking about his life, but Natalia is distracted by the evocative dancers. Vorrei avere degli amici, ma sempre gli stessi. Qualcuno... La sera, quando esco dall'ufficio, non vengo più in posto come questi. Mi piace andare in giro solo. Pensare, fantasticare. Allora anche lei è un sognatore. Beh, sa com'è. La fantasia bolle come. come l'acqua in una caffettiera. Sì, ma è un errore, si finisce con credere che ci sia qualcosa di, di vivo, di tangibile, anche nei sogni, che si trascura la, la vita, capisce? La realtà, questa realtà qui. As Gary Rosenshield explicates in Points of View and the Imagination in Dostoevsky's White Nights, this is the thesis to be tested by Dostoevsky's dreamer. He condemns his dreaming as a sin against life, for not only has it failed to sustain him, it has also condemned him to a hopeless and barren future. He rarely forgets that his confession is as much a ploy to win Nastenka's sympathy as it is a sincere expression of his frustrated hopes. Here the dreamer in Mario is still a bit more grounded in reality than Natalia, or at least he thinks. He condemns her hope for her lover's return as the fantasies of a child, yet he is just as susceptible to the fantasy that he can win the love of a woman whose love is taken. The dancers kick up, particularly led by Dirk Sanders, who is also the film's choreographer, who seems to eye Natalia seductively. Nonetheless, it is effective, as Natalia is overtaken by the sheer joy of the dance's eruption. Partially out of jealousy, Mario joins in, ending the raucous affair with a solo that can best be described as ostentatious. 
Marcello Mastroianni has experienced dancing quite well in his filmography, so for him to tap into this kind of inexperienced, carefree dancing is simply incredible. The dancing ends and Mario is officially spellbound, proceeding to slow dance with Natalia. She too seems as she was with the lodger in rapture. When Visconti referred to Neo Intimissimo in regards to this film, this is what he meant, two real beings in the throes of bliss. <laughs> Ora posso dire anch'io di essere stata a ballare. Ora posso dire anch'io di essere stato felice. Which all comes crashing down when Natalia hears it's past ten. Like Cinderella, she flees to her usual spot with Mario in pursuit. She faints and he confesses his feelings for her, tells her to forget her ghosts, but she only wants him to go away so that the lodger won't see her with him. He flees angry and is accosted again by the prostitute. Deciding to take her up on her offer for some time spent together, she takes him to a spot to do the deed, and when he refuses, she claims to some passerby that he tried to take advantage of her, and a fight ensues. He spots Natalia once again, says he was right, that her lover didn't show up, and they make amends. Mario confesses that he never delivered the letter, but urges her to go on hoping. But Natalia, now dejected, claims she's glad he didn't deliver the letter, that that addition would have been a further humiliating blow to his not coming. She forgives him and expresses that maybe Mario's love should replace that of the lodger's, and that though she still loves the lodger, it will only take time before she doesn't any longer. Mario's now boosted with a joyful resolve, and they steal a boat, Travel to a spot in the canal where Mario saw couples go. Io vorrei farti dormire, ma come i personaggi delle favole che dormono per svegliarsi solo il giorno in cui saranno felici. Then ma... snow begins to fall. Ma che succede? Nevica. Both are overjoyed, and it appears as some distinct sign that everything's going to be okay. Back on land, the two have a snowball fight, endowed with a new faith in life. Like the world appeared to Dostoevsky after his cancelled execution, everything appears shining and bright to Mario, standing next to his bride-to-be. The snow stops and the two begin walking home. Rounding the corner to the bridge where Mario and Natalia first met, Natalia spots someone in the distance. She approaches and quickly runs to embrace him, shrugging off Mario's coat in the process. It's the lodger returned. She comes back to Mario and thanks him for all he's done. Vada lui, non devi avere rimorsi. Ho avuto torto io a volerti far dubitare. Vada lui. E che tu sia benedetta per l'attimo di felicità che mi hai dato. Non è poco, anche in tutta un'intera vita. Mario departs, back to where he started. The dog from the beginning approaches and follows as the film ends. To understand Le Notti Bianche is to understand its director, Lucino Visconti, and the cinematic landscape of Italy leading up to 1957. Post-war Italy redefined films with the burgeoning movement of Italian neorealism. Though definitions change, and sometimes it's not even recognized as an official codified movement, the traits that make up this paradigm shift of neorealism include a preference of portrayal of Italy's lower class, the use of on-location shooting and non-professional actors, 
and often an infusion of Marxist philosophy resulting in less contrived plots, more focus on depicting the everyday lives of the nation's populace. Visconti's 1943 Ossessione is widely considered the first solidly Italian neorealist film, cementing the movement along with Roberto Rossellini's 1946 Roma Città Aperta, or Rome Open City. Though doubtlessly influential for generations of filmmakers worldwide disaffected by the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, the period of pure neorealism really only lasted about a decade, with Il Miracolo Economico Italiano, or The Economic Miracle, spurred on by the Marshall Plan, ushering in the change. Those who had long suffered economically post-war didn't want to be reminded of their poverty and hardships on screen, while those who enjoyed the gifts brought on by the miracle had little to relate to. Thus, everything we think of as neorealism following this period tends only to be following neorealistic tendencies and stylizations. Pasolini's use of non-professional actors and less stylized cinematography was paired for classic literary adaptations in period settings. Rossellini would retain neorealistic subjects, but portray them with elements from Expressionism and Hitchcock. And while Fellini got his start under the tutelage of neorealist Rossellini, the vast majority of his works play with dreams and psychoanalysis. Visconti's own trajectory, despite being considered a founding father of the movement with his 1943 directorial debut in Ossessione, had begun to veer from the movement's traits early in his filmography. When we look at his final film, 1976 L'Innocente, and view his body of work as an evolution, we see a filmmaker who ended reveling in grandiosity, beauty, and a preference for period set films over contemporaneous ones. However, this is not to say Visconti abandoned neorealism altogether, but rather, like his contemporaries, modified its uses. Rocco e suoi fratelli, released just three years after the subject of today's video, has all the trappings of an Italian neorealist film. A rural family from Lucania try to make their way in industrial Milan, only to be met with much hardship. But despite the realistic setting and focus on the poorer populations of post-war Italy, the film does err on the melodramatic side, as familial tensions shift into emotional turmoil. This is a sentiment shared by Pauline Kael writing for The New Yorker at the time. The scale of the film is huge and operatic, and it loses the intimacy of the best neorealist films, and their breath of life. Funnily, in the same review, Kael describes the two leads of Annie Girardo and Alain Delon respectively as evocative of Nastaya Filipovna and Prince Mishkin in Dostoevsky's The Idiot. Indeed, Dostoevsky may have played an important role in modifying neorealism for future audiences. Both Dostoevsky and Italian neorealism often depicted the hardships of the working class, though the confines of the latter meant the interiority of characters and their psychology had to be implied or explicated in performance. Visconti would adapt Dostoevsky as early as 1946 with a theater production of Crime and Punishment but his familiarity with Dostoevsky may have gone beyond a few adaptations of his work. Interestingly, Visconti had his own eerily similar experience mirroring that of Dostoevsky's prime moment of ultimate realization in The Idiot. Following the German occupation of Rome, Visconti was apprehended and sentenced to death by firing squad by Pietro Koch, though saved last minute by the actress Maria Dany. Later, when the tides of the war turned and feared for the violence he enacted, Il Duce himself ordered Koch arrested, later to be tried and executed by the Italian High Court, Visconti's personal accounts providing one of the three damning testimonies. The brush with death and all the epiphanies of life that followed when you're allowed to live again, that's something Visconti and Dostoevsky had in common. Which is why something so simple as four nights spent rendezvousing with a girl, dreaming of the potential lifelong love that can spring from that encounter, a moment of happiness fit for a lifetime as the protagonist puts it. This spoke to Visconti. I have to say that I am attached to this little story, a huge one in Dostoevsky, small in my film, precisely because of the possibility it offers to escape from reality, for the contrast between the awakening in which all things are unpleasant, and those three hours at night spent with that girl who, it becomes a bit of a dream, something unreal, almost impossible. This game attracted me. For Visconti, theater was the avenue through which to transform a soured style of filmmaking, through artifice and performance, he could extrapolate deeper truths from humanity. Visconti had vast stints with the theater, and opera in particular, directing two renowned productions of Donizetti's Anna Bolena and Iphigenia in Tauride in 1957, the same year that brought us Le Noti Bianche. 
But Visconti, the evolution of neorealism took from all sources and mediums. In the Calle du Cinema interview, he had this to say, Avoiding theater is not a rule, especially if we think back to the origins of cinema. To Melier, for example, Brendan Hennessy investigated a link between this film in particular and the Kammerspiele movement of German theater in Notes on Theatrical Space in Lucino Visconti's Le Notti Bianche for MLN. Kammerspiele is named after the Kammerspiel House Theater, opened by Max Reinhardt, a smaller house whose intent was to bring the audience closer to the drama at hand, decreasing the emotional distance between them. We see several instances in this film where landscapes are foreshortened due to the set, thus bringing the emotions of characters into a fuller display, such as here where we can retain a wide shot on both Natalia and the lodger, leaving with Mario viewing them from the background. Hennessy also notes how Visconti put on a production of Strindberg's Miss Julie in the same year as this film's release, whose preface called for a desire for an increased closeness with audiences. Now that we know the influence of theater in Visconti's work at this time, let's look at how these theatrical changes were implemented. It must look as if it were unreal, but when you start to think it's unreal, it must look as if it were real. Intentional set design in Le Notti Bianche may play a larger role than in all of Visconti's filmography. It's perhaps the first giveaway as a demarcator from his pure brand of new realism prior. Unlike earlier works where the tradition of filming on locations was necessitated by the bombing of Cinecittà, Visconti was inspired in White Nights to recreate the theatricality of a stage in a hybrid style still affected by his neorealist roots. Indeed, Lavorno is a set in Genicita Studio 5, but it's a figure birthed more for the purpose of representation than recreation. Though rich in detail, the theatrical landscape offers more flexibility than would be afforded by shooting on location, such as Natalia recounting her story transposing us to her with a camera pan, the ability to see multiple characters on the same plane, landmarks like the bridge, even simpler details such as the Esso sign that marks the beginning and end of Mario's story, showing that despite all that's transpired, he's literally back where he started. Not to say elements of near realism didn't sleep in. We see the ruins of war with a bombed out landmark that Mario and Natalia often rendezvous at, for example. Other practical theater touches were expounded upon by Giuseppe Rotonno in the Criterion release of this film, where he explains how fog was recreated. Hundreds of square feet of a thin fabric, likely tulle, were hung up from Studio 5's rafters in sheets, which were unseen when not lit, but lit up at a precise moment, appeared like a hazy fog. The result differentiates itself from film, which would typically alter the lens in some way, to achieve a similar effect. There are clues in the scenic design that grind the reality part of Mario's dual views firmly in our time. As noted by Brendan Hennessy, Livorno is the birthplace of Italian communism and the eventual site of Kent Darby, becoming a symbol of American occupation in Italy. We are reminded of this history both with the remnants of the ruination Livorno received, as well as the appearance of American culture in the club dance sequence. The bridge upon which Mario and Natalia first meet is weighed with symbolic significance. Literally, it is a point dividing their respective houses, but as a metaphor it operates as a bridge between Mario's grounded humdrum of life in the dreamland offered to him by Natalia. Furthermore, the canals underneath are where this transition occurs. Mario is most sure of the possibility of a love life with Natalia when they are rowing a stolen boat through it, and where snow first falls, a sign to them to trust their instincts, and perhaps a sign of foreshadowing to us, the audience, that this relationship is fated to doom. And of course, these set pieces are the most theatrical of all. Mario and Natalia's snowball fight is the first time we see a horizon with the sky. We are drawn to its artifice as it explicates the notion that their blossoming love is more something of the imagination than reality. At least four scenes of significance are added to Visconti's film that don't appear in the novel. The extended club sequence, Mario's fight with the prostitute, the boat trip through the canal, and the sudden snowfall. The first sequence in the dance club does several important things. The first is to establish the setting, which is contemporary Livorno. We know this because of the song that plays. Thirteen Women and Only One Man in Town by Bill Haley and his Comets. The first lyrics, Last night I was dreaming, dreaming about the H-bomb, place it right in the 50s, while an American rock and roll song emphasizes the proliferation of American culture in the town. 
Its lyrics about a man getting treated to several women at once also seems to signify to Mario that his wish of having Natalia will be fulfilled. However, like with many omens in this film, what signifies good may in fact be a trick. The sequence also has a display of dramatic irony. The dancer may as well be looking at Mario himself, foretelling of some impending doom to befall him. Just as well it may be a warning to Mario that, should his wooing of Natalia succeed, there will be more potential suitors eyeing her in the future. Next is the inclusion of the prostitute character, played by Visconti regular Clara Calamai. Her presence is somewhat ominous, appearing in several scenes in the background and attempting to interact with Mario. Hennessy posits that the prostitute represents an older version of Italy, while Natalia represents an Italy Visconti aspires for, but I think it goes beyond that. For the sake of this hypothesis, consider Mario as a stand-in for Visconti himself, and these women, Natalia and the prostitute, as the respective loves in his life, theater and neorealism. Natalia is full of life and expression, finding it difficult to rein in her stronger emotions. When she's sad, she's heartbroken and in tears, jovial and bubbly when happy. She also represents a world of dreams and representation, where daily life can be transfigured into that of fairy tales. Visconti's nod to the prostitute's origin include the casting of a traditional Italian actress in Calamai, known for her prior near-realist roles. Her occupation is one that defines her without her consent, and firmly planted in the grim realities of post-war Italy. She is merely the nameless prostitute, who may only know one kind of love, and acts out against the pain of rejection she's felt time and time again. Visconti, as Mario, rejects the prostitute in favor of the dream girl, but returns when the dream girl spurns his affections, which succinctly represents the Madonna whore dichotomy. Summarily, he treats the whore brashly and with disdain upon returning to her. Mario's beating at the hands of townspeople, especially the old stock of Livorno, people still fresh to the horrors of war, just as well could represent his harsh receptions for trying new things. Remember Pauline Kael's scathing review of the melodramatics of Rocco? She was not alone among swaths of critics admonishing Visconti for his perceived betrayal of the movement he helped pioneer. This film itself was seen as a peculiarity for some time in his body of work, to the point where he had to vouch for its existence in Leggere Visconti as a parenthesis rather than a rest. These are the real reasons to judge White Knights, which remains something apart, like someone who writes a short story every now and then, in the breaks of other more important things. The conclusion of the prostitute story is its own mini-tragedy within Le Notti Bianche. She despairs. <laughs> She too plays with the contradictions of a character like Natalia. She pushes Mario away after he rejects her, then tries to save him from the townspeople. Perhaps for her, real love is expressed, or at least initiated, through sex. His rejection for the latter was a rejection to get to know her as a person. Thus abandoned by Mario, then by the townspeople, Calamai's prostitute presents the most near-realistic vignette in the film, as well as an allegory for the movement as a whole. No matter what it did, it couldn't win. And as the economic miracle ushered in prosperity, mostly paved over its post-war past, filmmakers like Visconti would seek other avenues to express their art. The canal boat trip acts primarily as a consummation of the two's newfound affection, or at least Natalia's attempts towards eventual affection on her part. But it also acts as the intoxication of Mario, who prior would scoff at Natalia's outlandish ideas, but in the canal's depths, now sees his eventual marriage to Natalia not a potential, but a guarantee. Here he says, Un giorno, tu ti sveglierai e vedrai che una bella giornata ci sarà il sole. E tutto sarà nuovo, cambiato, limpido. E quello che prima ti sembrava impossibile diventerà semplice, normale. Non ci credi? Io sono sicuro. E presto. Under the bridge between reality and fantasy, Mario has become completely enveloped in dreams, which are further cemented by snowfall. I mentioned before how the snow seems to the duo a sign that their fates have been given the go-ahead by a higher power, and they rejoice in the freedom of their choice, even if the snow may actually indicate a warning. This is partially because weather foreshadowed events in each night of the short story. Gary Rosenshield for the Slavic and Eastern European Journal notes how the weather of each night progressively worsens, 
until the significantly improved fourth night, which proves to be deceptive as it heralds the lover's return, followed by the morning after, which is dark and dreary. Likewise, the majesty of the snow and the comfort it brings are tricks for both the characters and the audience who loosen up before immediate and cruel blow. This is a personal favorite Marcello Mastroianni performance of mine as he's playing into an underrated type of his, the novice. Though he's often well regarded as a suave leading man in Fellini's films and as the attached to the hip counterpart for Sofia Loren, the Notti Bianche betrays an archetype closer to Mastroianni's own personality. In Marcello Mastroianni, I remember, we see key insights into his off-screen persona and more goofball tendencies. One example I can think of is when Mastroianni was in New York and stumbled upon Ang Bancroft. Trying to flirt, he started reciting lines to her from La Dolce Vita, only for her to speak back to him in Italian and not fall for his game. Essentially, I think Mastroianni was able to play the charmer who wasn't self-aware of his own shortcomings remarkably well, as in Le Notti Bianche where he tries explaining his grandiose life philosophies to Natalia, whose attention is anywhere but. Especially fitting is that they seem to tailor the dreamer character in this adaptation towards Mastroianni. Here it is Natalia whose fantasies are less grounded and bordering on the obsessive, while Mario is a bit more stubbornly stuck in his ways. Yet, it's his attempts at flirting and bumbling peacocking and dancing that make it known that Mario isn't as grounded as he thinks. Maria Schell's contributions are just as significant. Her portrayal of a girl who's not quite grown up are accentuated by her bright eyes and smile and mannerisms like biting her nails. Schell was an Austrian Swiss actress and a hot commodity after the success of Gervaisi and was contracted for only a short period of time, leading to a speedier production. She also apparently learned Italian in a short span of time to the delight of the crew, and much of the affect she infused into her performance would likely have been lost with a dub. As mentioned before, her character is also modified from the story to be more of an accentuated dreamer, whereas Dostoevsky's Nastenka acknowledges the implausibility of her lover's return, but stoically makes an attempt regardless. Shell's Natalia is indecisive, flirtatious, and prone to frequent mood swings. Briefly, I'd like to examine what other adaptations of the source material did differently, and what they offer to the grand narratives of the story. White Knights, Ivan Piriev. The first Russian film adaptation of the story came two years after La Notte Bianche. Directed by Ivan Piriev, it's a more direct period adaptation with Oleg Sturzenyev's dreamer, a more Dostoevsky in figure, primed for fluctuations between wide-eyed optimism and extreme melancholy. Despite what the posters would have you believe, the film fits the atmosphere of a dream with bold technicolor and a swelling score. It's impressive that a Moss film production is able to mimic the emotional bombacity of a contemporary Hollywood blockbuster, and it works as an adaptation in its own right. Shabhar Roshan, Farsad Motaman. Shabhar Roshan is a highly underseen Iranian adaptation directed by Farsad Motaman. It takes more liberal interpretations of the source material that all work in its favor, making the dreamer a disillusioned literary professor, with his eventual turn to dreamer in love that much more drastic. This version also makes good use of voiceover to narrate the dreamer's inner thoughts present in the story, and seeing as he's a literature professor, it's remarkably fitting that he had these types of inner monologues during his periods of isolation. Poetry is an omnipresent aspect of this film, being a main topic of discussion between the two, and each line of dialogue reads like prose and thoughtful ruminations on life. There's also a fun little nod to Lenotti Bianche where a poster for said film hangs in his apartment. The irony being that if the professor knew the plot of the movie, he would also know everything that's about to transpire. Highly recommend this adaptation. Two Lovers, James Gray. This one's the wild card of the bunch, as rather than a direct adaptation, this film more loosely translates some of the core ideas from the story, namely a loner who pursues a woman in the spirit of life that's already occupied, along with several other story beats. First off, New York is a wonderful setting for the story, with the landscape informing the narrator's loneliness. Here, the dreamer's infatuation with buildings and the stories they tell is transplanted onto a passion for landscape photography. Joaquin Phoenix, of course, thrives in these socially inept, downtrodden characters, and this role is no exception. So many little quirks of his that are so genius and so early in his filmography, where he'd go on to perfect this kind of performance later in his career. The element of having two women is an interesting one that was flirted with in Lo Noti Bianche, 
allowing him to switch off when either his interest isn't sustained or he doesn't get his way. The handsome dreamer is a bit immoral in this regard. When he learns his dream girl is taken, he tries to feign disinterest, or sabotage the relationship, or inspire jealousy. However, there is one very personal gripe that slips through. If Leonard were I, I would not fumble Vanessa Shaw for Gwyneth Paltrow. Simply unfathomable. Also shout out for slipping in an awkward dance capade. We love to see it. Overall, an excellent film that gets at the core ideas of the story while doing its own thing. Mario's resignation at the end of the film is thematically underscored by his return to the city streets, along with the stray dog that greeted him in the film's opening. A companion, yes, but a symbol that, having given up the dream of Natalia and the alternate life she offered, he'll instead return to his old practices that made him so spiritually dead to begin with. It's lacking the stories afterward where the protagonist is invited to Nastenka's wedding, and he derives optimism from the series of encounters provides an avenue of authorship on Visconti's part. His protagonists, most notably in Il Gatto Pardo, are often outsiders in a world quickly changing without them. Il Gatto Pardo, spoilers, also ends with the protagonist entering an Italian city street with an unsure future. In the literal sense, we can identify Mario's alienation in his inability to socialize with those around him and his attempts at dancing. Though far more significant is his resolution in resignation. It's the aspect of humanity where people get married in non-ideal relationships, thinking the act will somehow change everything, or that that's what you're supposed to do. Have children with that same partner, enter careers they despise but make money, drudge through the mundanities of life because you believe you're not owed happiness, die fearing you've lived an unfulfilling life. What's more of a tragedy than treading through life as a somnambulist, than having experienced the spark of magic and lost it? knowing you'll never know if or how you'll get it back. But unlike the dreamer of the story, who relies on the notion that a small moment of happiness is just enough for a lifetime, almost to comfort himself in his deteriorated condition, the dreamer in Mario is not crestfallen. Standing on his own two feet, he re-enters his world with a loyal companion, knowing that nothing may ever match that genuine elation he had in finding love, but doing so regardless. We must imagine Sisyphus happy, and we must experience life fully, even with all of the knowledge we have about it. And that's one of the realist theses one can get from a Visconti film, and it wasn't a near realist one, even derided for not being one. And it's a reason to not get stuck in a filmic form that doesn't yield the answer you're looking for. For who knew when Visconti made Ossessione, a film that exhibits such inherent truths about working class individuals, that he delivered the same results in a form that utilizes artifice to its advantage? With Valentine's Day, it's important to remember some lessons from Mario's experience. 1. Don't try to steal someone's affection if theirs is already taken. 2. Be honest with yourself first, and then project that when speaking to others. 3. Dance your ass off as if no one's looking, even if they are. And 4. <laughs> Hello everyone, thanks for making it through this video. It was uh, a pleasure and a labor of love to work on. Sorry about the delay in between uploads, but as Jeff Goldblum says, you know, life finds a way to uh, hamper your video editing time. If you've subscribed, thank you very much. And if not, hello, welcome uh, to the channel. Stay a while. This is going to be more of a regular thing from now on, um, now that I've got my bearings straight. I already have an idea for the next video, and once I get started on it, I'm anticipating that it's gonna come out in March sometime, which is pretty prescient because it's about something that is coming out in April, and I'll just leave it at that. Please feel free to comment, um, whether it's about this film or Lucino Visconti, New Realism, or any film topics. Um, I may be, I may be considering 
covering certain topics that are recommended in the future, but for now I think I've just got some things that I want to work on first, but there's always time. And once again, thank you so much for all the positive reception and just watching my videos and everything. Yeah, it's been great. And uh, if you celebrate, happy Valentine's Day. And I'll see you in the next video.